Cool. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, lovely, lovely to be here today. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for coming along to listen to uh, this little talk by myself. Uh, I'd like to thank Kabu as well for having me speak, and of course to you, Alex, for organising everything so efficiently. Um, so today I'd like to speak to you a little bit about your content, uh, something that obviously is very important for most SEO, digital marketing, PPC, email, whatever kind of campaign is something that's very important to all of us. And specifically about how to think about your content in order to make connections with your searchers, connections with your potential audience, to understand what they want so they find you uh, when they search. Uh, secondly, I want to share a little bit about what has proven to be a really great environment here. Uh, we have a white.net, a kind of content development environment we've created, we've worked with our clients to create in order to generate great content that covers these topics for search so successfully. Uh, but start with a little bit about myself first, obviously as Alex said, my name is Charlie and I'm the Head of Marketing at White.net. We're a digital marketing agency based in Oxford and we specialise in technical SEO, content, paid media and digital PR. Uh, we have two strong beliefs in how we work, first of all that search marketing is a craft of having to constantly improve and it's very hard to stand out amongst the crowd, that's what you're going to be aiming for, and secondly that everyone can do digital marketing, everyone can make a difference, everyone can do a little bit of SEO, a little bit of digital marketing and really improve their business, something we find very exciting. I've worked in online for coming up to seven years, which I still can't, can't quite believe when I say it, and I've worked in-house and for a couple of agencies in the time. Uh, uh, one of the big jobs I did, uh, I've done stuff for all kinds of people from small businesses to large businesses to agencies. Uh, started off with jobs in technical SEO and content and moved to looking after content for a large e-commerce retailer with uh, tens of thousands of products before moving into agency. And in recent years at White.net my thinking has very much been on content and by default as a result of that keyword research. As, as I said before, content is the kind of glue that holds all online marketing together. SEO campaign, you need content. Email campaign, you need content. Building an app, you need content in some form. And just over a year ago, I did a webinar on SEMrush, uh, for SEMrush, which uh, was about a user-centered approach to building content for traffic and links. That's where I first met Alex. And the basic premise was that by building content on topics, we can prove our audience actually wants we can build content that will actually be marketable, we can use it for outreach, we can use it for email campaigns, we can use it to earn links and shares, and the search engine traffic will follow as a result because it's on topic. And the basic concept of that was that the theory is that by taking the principles of user-centered design and applying them to keyword research and content creation, we stand much more chance of creating content that will work for our audience and for search engines. Uh, today's talk is the evolution of that, taking this style of approach and adding a model of thinking and process, an actual process we can do, to actually create that content. This is very important because uh, I believe very strongly that content is uh, something that we can all make advantage of. Every website has an audience they can research, understand and serve. Everyone has that. But with more and more of us creating content, there's more and more websites all the time, and with a high percentage never actually doing content marketing, content creation, good copywriting, etc., the competition is increasingly tight, it's increasingly difficult, uh, there's it's less and less room for us to stand out. And as I said, something we strongly believe is that standing out is vital. So how do we actually stand out? Well, I've called my talk Understanding Your Audience, and I want to speak with you today about taking our content game up a level in order to do that, by digging into our audience, by using mythologies that are common in some of our sister disciplines, such as UX um, and above the line uh, advertising, uh, content marketing, all kinds of dis dis disciplines. We can create better websites and content of the depth that we are always being told that we should be creating. First, though, I want to tell you a little story about how I got to this point. Uh, some of you folks will have worked in SEO for probably more than four years, and you'll probably remember a time of pre-Panda, when SEO content was a little more easy, a little more cookie-cutter, to say the least. My first job in SEO was at a travel company, and I started work on their ferry websites, and um, uh, I was looking at that, so I was looking at... Uh, on-page content, off-page, which was mainly done by firing up some nice great box, and generally trying to build a successful website. So 
I learned how to make content with ferries. Now that's exactly how to capture your audience's attention with glamorous subjects as big metal boxes moving slowly across the sea. I know. But it's important because my specific target when I first started working this website was keyword research and to help build content resources targeted to our most important keywords. Kind of an obvious SEO thing to do. So it started off really fine. Uh, I had to build a page on a big subject such as ferries to France. Nothing wrong with that. Lots of things, like I said, the topic, the routes, the boats, the times, number of crossings, all kinds of information. Great, unique page. My next page was ferries from France. Okay, sort of the inverse of what I just said, but I can sort of, technically they're different routes because they're going in the direction. There's still plenty of them, so I can still do some fairly unique stuff here. Uh, next page was um, France ferries. Kind of running out of steam by this point. I'm going to write about the ships themselves. What does France ferries even mean as a term? It doesn't even make much grammatical sense. They didn't just finish there, and carried on. No, there's more cross channel ferries, Dover to Calais ferries, Calais to Dover ferries, and my favourite, French ferries. French, I don't know what a French ferries is actually meant to refer to. There wasn't exactly a need for all these different pages. This was repetitive, SEO driven content that wasn't actually useful to any users. But this was legitimate. We actually did this uh, experiment on one of the multiple websites we had where we just created a, what, a single page for ferries to France and ferries to Belgium, etc., and didn't have all these multiple variations. We put it live, and this one of the smaller websites, it completely tanked. Its visibility went through the floor, and we had to revert it because otherwise it was actually not making any money at all. So at the time, this was working. Of course, this guy then soon came along and absolutely changed all that. The panda came along, improved things, cookie cut content, no good. Now we can work in much more interesting and frankly, normal human ways of actually producing content, which is a great thing to be doing. The industry and I uh, now think quite differently, and we think in broad terms. We think in what I like to call buckets of keywords. So we have groups, and the single page uh, is a great resource in its own. Instead of being optimized for one keyword per page, as that cookie cutter stuff I was just showing you, it's now done for potentially tens or even hundreds of keywords in a single page. It's a great resource, a great individual page that works really hard and does a lot of different stuff. There's a couple of great articles on the topic on screen here that I recommend you check out if you're kind of this idea is new to you. We've come a long way since that, that bit of early content I started working on then. This is four years ago. No, sorry, this is seven years ago. And um, about four years ago, Panda came along, and suddenly everything's different. We now work in a much more friendly way rather than my friend, uh, ferry escapades. And I think we've become open to embracing the influence of a variety of sister disciplines in creating great websites. These all come together into what I've started just calling in house here at White, and generally when I talk about it, as content development. Just as developers, website developers, build great site architecture, the design and so on, we're developing content resources based on user need and search data. We have a reason for stuff. We build a user journey for our content, not just for the website itself. And all the ideas around that, such as the data I just mentioned, but also UX, user experience, content strategy, social media, as to give us clues on how to engage your audience, where this all comes together and allows us to create much better resources that speak the user's language, that actually are helpful, and actually create something that we can market successfully by pushing out to people because they can see it's a great resource. This is great SEO stuff. And it was while looking at all these sister disciplines and these related fields that I came across a really interesting article by Richard Prowse from the University of Bath, and a great speaker on content strategy, I must say. Uh, he was talking about how in this article, the link is on screen, how the University of Bath had taken an agile approach to doing the content strategy, the governance of their website, uh, to, for their large um, university website. It was um, uh, as many university sites are, uh, tens of thousands of pages, and there needed to be some kind of really clever way of doing governance, and agile was their solution. This struck me as being absolutely fantastic because it's keenly related to what many of us are already trying to achieve. Agile thinking is about having user needs as the priority 
across the everything you do. Working on one thing at a time, fixing a user need, moving on to the next challenge. And that kind of makes sense with how many of us produce content for websites for search. We actually go, right, we have a new product, a new service, a new topic to talk about. We want to do a really good job of it, move on to the next one. But it's about taking the idea of user needs that's going to take it to that next level. Sustainable success by looking through our audience's eyes at everything we do. Without realizing that, I think we've already started working uh, to one of the main principles of agile working. The guiding principle, I mean, is that putting user needs as the primary goal, the perspective of the audience is the key. As we've seen, we've already started taking helpful elements from related disciplines such as UX, content strategy, and so on, in its content development approach to way of working. So it immediately made sense to me that the agile ethos gave us a reason, an attitude, the reason why we put them with these things all together for SEO. Perhaps why we like them so instinctively as SEOs is that these things make sense to us and the agile ethos we can put on top of that puts it together. But of course, when you hear the term agile, you kind of think agile is for developers. It's very much a term related to describe as we're an agile agency, we like to think agile. But agile actually technically we know it's to do with web development and to do with scary things called scrums uh, that involve like large ways of working and putting website projects together. But I'd like to see us take this agile approach, this agile mindset to content as well. It's about research, publication and refinement which probably sounds pretty similar to many of us here when we've been working in SEO for a while. And it kind of sounds like where we're headed even more in the future. Because this developer environment is actually exactly what I think we need to try and achieve. In order for our content to be taken seriously, for our work to be taken seriously and to achieve results, we should be thinking in a strategic and tactile manner, putting both together. This layer of agile thinking helps us understand our audience and apply that to everything we do already, and it brings it all together. So I say that SEO content, keyword research, UX content strategy, social media, content marketing, all with an agile approach to how we do it, is what a content environment should actually be. And I think this is tremendously exciting because this is something we started doing with seeing great results with. I believe everybody who does SEO, whether their budget is huge or their budget is relatively small, you can take this mindset, you can take this discipline, you can take this attitude and make it work for you and produce good results. And that's why I want to talk to you about this, because it's what these guys want, it's what Google wants to do. I don't have time, nor do you think me to tell you that a huge part of Google's updates over the past few years, since Panda, has been uh, all about quality, all about you know having presenting good content. The recent Phantom updates, the one earlier this year in May, and the one that the update on May the 9th, uh, sorry, November the 19th, that has been a lot written about, is really interesting. It's all leading towards this idea of presenting high quality content. The stuff that came out about Rank Brain at the end of October being a machine learning algorithm that actually sort of works out what the user intent is, they believe the user intent is behind the new searches they haven't seen before to provide better results. It's really fascinating because this all comes from that as well and the uh, learning from the quality rater guidelines that got leaked and then obviously released by Google last month. All that seems to be feeding directly into whatever the kind of phantom update is. It all comes together. The search for quality that Google is on all the time is absolutely key to what we want to do. This is important for us because I hear an awful lot of the time from talks, from other people, from articles, that the solution is to do whatever kind of technical thing they said to find new content or understand the topic and then just build great content. Building content is now just being the new way of saying that content is king. Because I don't know about you guys, I'm kind of tired of hearing this. We have nothing more on it, any more detail, we don't get anything that actually helps us make the most of this. We don't get to hear how people do this and that's what I want to share a little bit of today about how I go producing them. The thing is, is that not all content obeys the same rules. Not all content and what makes it great is going to be the same for my e-commerce website as it is for your newspaper website. There's a difference in what the user actually wants. This goes back to the point of that this is what users actually need. I'll give you an example here of product pages for a large e-commerce website. This is John Lewis. This is a page taken from uh, several months ago. and. It's uh, for a pair of Nike Free 5.0 women's running trainers. In the color violet, they had about seven different colors on the website at the time. 
nothing unusual about that, it seems to make sense, good looking page, all pretty good. But when we actually examine the content, something interesting happens. The product information box in the top left hand corner you can see here is exactly the same for all the seven different shoes within this range. It's the same thing for no matter what the colour is, it's the same basic information on that individual product. The brand story at the bottom of the page is for, on the same, sorry, it's the same for every single page that is a Nike product. So anytime you have a Nike product, you see this brand story. That's a lot, that's hundreds of products on the website. The delivery information on the right hand side is the same on every single page apart from certain large household appliances across the website. Tens of thousands of pages. And this is all the content on the page apart from the picture you saw uh, higher up on the previous slide. This is all the page has. It doesn't have anything unique. It doesn't have anything particularly um, sort of what you describe as being outstanding or great. And I know obviously journalists is a great domain and they can play on that and they can sell a lot of that. But the point is this is the useful content. This is actually what the audience needs on this page to be able to make their decision to be able to choose to buy this product or not and to move on. Now this page is duplicate. It's, you know, it's, it's got a lot of things we might argue is against SEO good principle. It's against what you might hear you should always do. And I'm not suggesting you take this track, but it's interesting that what makes content great is not always the same. Another example of this is we're always given the uh, idea of what about challenging or new industries. Uh, industries where you can't do something interesting, such as plumbing. How do you produce great content for that? Maybe a content marketing piece on building your own bathroom or something like that. But again, how relevant can you do that? How often can you keep on doing it, especially as a small business? And what counts as great content in that is, is intrinsically not as interesting. And what counts as great content in a product that's new? So you've got nothing to compare it to. How do you compare it to be great if you don't know what you're comparing it against? These are interesting questions, and these are things that I think that agile thinking content development environment actually helps us answer because we're actually looking at each individual case and understanding our audience rather than relying purely on keyword volume driving what content we produce. So in order not to be guilty of the same thing, I thought if we take this agile attitude, how do we build quality content that Google knows we want? What feeds this content development environment that I particularly am so excited about? Well, I believe this is the answer. At its heart, SEO is about questions, and I think if I get you to take away nothing else from the talk today apart from this, guys, I'd love you to remember this, that at its heart, SEO is about questions. You may have seen Google's uh, recent TV advert, I say recent, it was in, like, in the summer, so probably about six months ago, uh, but it was an advert for their search app, the iPhone and uh, Android search app, and at the, it's kind of put it at the heart of what they think search means to the public. And what they think search means to the public as an app on your phone is answering a question and getting an answer. How many times have you heard the expression, just Google it? I've used it all the time, lots of people have used it. You might even, you know, you occasionally might say just Bing it just to be funny, but generally the fact is you say, just Google it. And it's a really interesting thing that people say because people use it when there's a question in the room that nobody knows the answer to and either nobody can be bothered to look it up another way or nobody wants to pick up the phone. You say, just Google it to get an answer to a question. We know that using a search engine is asking a question and getting an answer. Now, I really like these adverts, but they inspired me perhaps not in the way that Google or the producers were intending when they made them. To me, they represent a real opportunity for us as digital marketers. And that's because with search, you're looking for an answer to a question, sometimes an actual question, sometimes an implied question. This quote is from uh, the founder of DuckDuckGo, a uh, very interesting search engine. Imagine some of you already use it. It's a really cool thing to do. There's some really interesting stuff. But this is someone who's built a search engine saying, when you do a search, you want an answer. And it really cuts to the core of what we need. Say so either it's a direct question we're asking or it's an implied question. What do I mean by an implied question? Well, something like this where I type in Facebook and in, put it into the Omnibar and I can't be bothered to write the words .com. And so I ask a question in the search engine, which is, where do I find the website Facebook? And that's my implied question is, where do I find Facebook? It makes you wonder when you see this, though, because the term Facebook itself just gets so many searches, you know, X million searches per month. It makes you wonder how many of the 3 billion searches Google gets per day are actually just relative, you know, relatives of mine, technically inept members of my family who can't be bothered to actually type the word .com. I digress, but this is the point. Every search is a question. 
So I'm looking for questions. This is what I want to do. Every search is a question, and I want to take this agile approach where I build all my content with the user at its heart, answering the question one at a time, doing this all within a great content development environment. So how do I listen to the audience? Well, any successful SEO or content relies on data, cold, hard, historical information we can use to make decisions. It's great stuff. We love it. So how do I get that data? Start off with Google Analytics. You want to understand what is working on your website first of all. The clue I find with Google Analytics is this little box just down here. Turn insights into action. There is stuff you can mine into Google Analytics to understand that. There was also uh, also um, a recent um, uh, webinar done right here on Kaboo uh, by um, Write My Site about uh, using Google Analytics to create content. And it's a similar principle to that. So if you haven't seen that webinar, I strongly recommend you go and check it out. It was really enjoyable by a great speaker. And um, it was a, you, know, you can learn a lot from that. From this point of view, what's the first thing I'd be doing? I, I, I like to go and check out my organic traffic and see what landing pages have got. What does Google already think I'm a good answer for? Every search is a, a question. What am I already a good answer for? You see, which pages do a good job of answering questions? And then starting from that, well, hang on, I'd expect us to be a good answer on this or a good answer on that. It's not the same as keyword rankings that we rank for, you don't for. Actually understanding what content is working as an answer, not just the initial individual keyword ranking. Really great place to start. Why are people leaving the site? When are they leaving the site? Where are they leaving the site? I think you look at your exit pages. Again, I've got a filter here for organic traffic. And you want to look at this exit rate on the right hand side. Now, bear in mind you also want to be checking out number of previous pages read. You want to be checking out the bounce rate. You want to be checking out how long they spent on the page. It could be they're leaving the page at this point because you've answered the question really well. But Depending on what you're actually doing with your website, have you answered it well, have you achieved your goal, are you doing everything you can do? This goes back to the theory of Google really liking answers that they know satisfy their users. And one of the ways to check this is by the idea of long click versus short click, as in people do a search, they go to a website, they get a good answer, they don't go back to the search, or if they go back to the search engine, they're asking a refinement of the question. They're asking something new. So if you're going to be checking out here, it's been making sure that your good content, your strong content, is actually answering the question that's sticking on the page and they're getting the answer they want. Okay, so a little bit about having to do it, you know, make a bit of an extrapolation, make a bit of an estimate because you don't get the exact data on it because you can't ask the user, at least at this point, but you can make some really good decisions by looking at what content is working and what isn't. Beyond Google Analytics then, looking at our own content, starting to look at other people's content. How can we get some insight? Well, what's earned our audience's interest, I think, is a really good way to ask. Whatever niche you're in, you can drill down quite refine this, or you can go quite top level. Within our niche, what content earned interest from our audience? Now, there's a couple ways of doing this. Uh, one of my favorite tools to do this is Ahrefs. Uh, it's got both uh, a way of checking out a topic and checking out which articles have been the most popularly shared. And also, of course, you can put in any competitor website or a bunch of links and actually see how many links have been put into that as Ahrefs best known for being a link tool. Now, this is really good stuff because if I want to know what's working, what actually is answering audiences' questions, it's the ones that have earned the links and the shares because people have said it's good. It's not always an exact match. If you anyone heard Rand's talk from Search Love a couple of months ago in London, very interesting that social shares do not equal links in the way that marketers have previously tried to assume. But the theory is very true. Actually, if something has earned shares, if it's earned links, it's worth us checking out to say, what questions does this answer? Is this of interest to our audience? Is this the kind of thing that's actually earning us the interest we want? Similarly, you've got BuzzSumo. So BuzzSumo does it for purely shares, Ahrefs, and Majestic, really good for using it for links as well. But what kind of content is earning our audience interest? It's obvious stuff, stuff we've... I think you know most of us have done many times before, and it's certainly been pointed out to us many times before. But coming with a different attitude, so just look at going, what got the most? Actually, try and look at it from a more refined point of view of why has it actually got our audience's interest? What questions has it answered? What need has it solved? Great thing about BuzzSumo, uh, got highlighted here in the middle of the page on the towards the right, is you can view the sharers. So if you've got the the pro account, you can view the sharers, and obviously, so if you create something that answers another question, a related question, or this question even better because actually these, none of these articles answer it that well. People who've shared it, 
you might want to point out to them and say, hey, you might worth checking out this resource I've created instead. Classic content marketing work. I think this is a really good, uh, good tool for doing that. That's why a lot of people, I think, are loving Buzzsumo. Next up is Topsy. Topsy is perhaps my, I put it here because I think social mining is a great way of understanding our audience. Something that's really important. What's the audience talking about? Topsy is my favorite tool for this. It's got two modules. The right hand side, you can see, you can put in a topic and see individual tweets people are talking about. Again, find the natural language. Find questions, but you can search for questions on Topsy. Find you know, the sort of stuff people are talking about. Find the natural language. Find what questions they're asking. What's a hot topic? What do people want to know? What can you help with? And then on the bottom side, oh, sorry, bottom left there, We've got um, you've got the Topsy Analytics where you can compare several different topics. Here I've compared content marketing, SEO, and social media, just to see the relative popularity. But also you hover over it as I've done here, and it'll show you the most important tweet or the most uh, sort of shared, or powerful tweet of the day on said topic. And you can actually see what's really capturing people's attention. Often it's just about the famous people who've spoken on a topic, but other times you can really get some interesting insight into the issues people you know have had it sort of have peaked in their mind because other people are talking about it. User testing is something that I think we're becoming more familiar with in SEO. Again talk about you know us taking the best with other disciplines. User testing is fantastic for understanding our audience. Eye opening insight, it's Nothing beats footage of real user interaction. If you've never done it before, give it a go. It's incredibly fun. It can be ridiculously expensive to use with the big agencies. I'm not saying it's not worth it, but it's a lot of money to get a full UX testing service. But videos of someone like usertesting.com start at $49. They rapidly go to $99, but they start at $49. And you can normally get at least one for free to as a trial. So it's easy to give a quick go, and you get spoken and even... Uh, written and follow up answers fed back to you. You create a custom scenario, real users do a video, you can see the reactions and then you can make take action on the back of it. Often it's done for UX and for web design, but in terms of content, if you've got a content section that's really important to explaining your product service or as a content marketing piece to introduce your brand or something like that, you can test and see what of your content's done well and what hasn't. You can set a scenario up, tell them what they're looking to achieve and ask them, does this content do a good enough job? Of answering it or not. Fantastic. So so powerful and so bespoke to your needs. It's great. It's incredibly versatile. You can go as granular as you need, start it off cheap, highly recommend it. And my favorite tip about it is if you haven't got a website yet or you haven't got the content section of what you're looking to build as part of this process you're going through here, test the competition. Use a competition website. There's nothing saying you can't do that. The same way you can check out a competitor's backlinks or social shares, you can check out, do a user test on them. Say, hey, I want to build a content section on ferries to France. I haven't built my ferries to France section yet. I'm going to go to my competitors and do some testing, spend a bit of money, not too much, a little bit of money, and find out what users like and don't like about the content. What questions do they answer? What questions don't they answer? What do they do well or not? And then I can learn from that and do a better job with my website, and that's going to make me much, much, much more likely to succeed in my search campaign. Surveys. The thing I like about surveys is that if you've already got an audience, just to ask them. Instead of actually guessing what your audience wants, doing all stuff, just ask them. Now, there's multiple ways you can do surveys. There's a few options between the Survey Monkey, Survey Gizmo, and Ad from Google. So there's a couple of main ways of doing surveys. Um, the first one is using your existing audience, as I just said. So you can either do a little pop up on your screen. I'm sure we've got very used to that by now in the pop up saying, Would you like to answer a couple of questions? And if it's just a singular question, it's be a pop up yes, no. You click on it and it goes away, or it can take them to a separate survey. Um, or you can ask an audience you've already got. So if you've got um, an email list or something like that, you can ask um, all people who've bought a product to go to a page and fill out a survey. Um, you can use a Google form for that if you want to do it for free. Survey Monkey, Survey Gizmo have really good cheap prices. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is if you haven't got a ready made audience, you've actually got a new website, you've got a new section, or you just haven't got a big enough email list yet, you can pay. You can actually just go, right, if I've got a big enough top level topic, I can actually say, hey, I, I, go, I go to this company and I want to find 10,000 people. To that's a lot, but you can ask 10,000 people to answer question, a quality questions and topic to get their answers to be able to build some useful content for them. Now, Google have their consumer service that does this, so they gizmo lets you do this kind of stuff. Um, 
it's that's obviously going to cost you more. It's more expensive than it was doing, but it does mean you can get a huge amount of data really quickly in order to base decisions on. Great, great way of getting audience insight and stuff. The Siege Media example, I've got the link up on the screen right now, is a really worthwhile article. Check out this if it piques your interest because it goes into some good detail on what you can do. Next up, questions. I said such is all about questions. Why not see what questions other people are already answering on your topic to know what you should be answering? So a favorite of my place is compared to FAQs. Most FAQs on websites are dull and to do with returns policies and where they're based and this and the stuff that doesn't even need FAQ. Occasionally you'll happen to be lucky enough to work in a product or service where some or all of your competitors have actually got good FAQs on the product or service. Uh, they actually talk about the industry, they talk about stuff that you can actually go, oh, this is an important question about our topic. Now they're addressing that. I'm going to you know, sort of take all those ideas and put them to my keywords so we'll see if people are searching for this. And if they are, I'm going to write about it as well. This is, a, you know, as a result, checking out computer FAQs. FAQ Fox is a website that kind of allows you, doesn't always work, some of them does, allows you to put in a topic and then scrape competitor FAQs. Very cool. Quora is one of my favorite weapons of doing this. Quora is a great thing for keyword research, guys. I cannot recommend it enough. It's manual labor. You have to spend time doing it. But in this case, it's great. I love it. What is the, uh, I've got an example on the screen. What would be the best way to cross from the UK to France as a foot passenger? With a Labrador dog, not any other dog, not an Alsatian or a poodle dog, but specifically a Labrador dog. But the point is, there's a question here on being a foot passenger on a ferry with pets. Now you can take that as a topic, put that into your favourite keyword research methods, find the variations, do the search volumes, put it all together. If there's enough variations, put it into one of those resource pages. You know, actually about like, you know, this is covering the topic in detail in a great way that you can understand and you know you've got yourself a new topic by being useful by answering questions. Core is really good for this kind of stuff. I spoke about how last year I did a talk on user-centered content and user-centered content research has been at the forefront of my mind for the last 18 months. I wrote a post on this, sorry to be quite so self-promotional, but I wrote a post on this on the Momentology blog uh, a couple of months ago Oh, no, I'm going to say four months ago now, actually, um, about user-centric keyword research. And it's about doing quality keyword research that unveils your user needs by looking at the user intent behind the term. Actually going, right, if somebody does a search for the keyword content marketing, it's not much use to us. Yes, it's a big topic which will show up as having millions of searches per month, so I'd love to appear number one for it. But we have no idea what the need is. Do they want content marketing to do themselves? They're looking for an agency to do it for them. They're looking for ideas. Are they looking for a definition? There's all these different things. It, it, the intent is opaque because it's too generic. And the idea of user-centric keyword research is to go just not too much deeper, one step level further down from that, and actually understand what the user intent is and base your content decisions around that. So we've got our ideas of understanding our audience, listening to what they want, but now we're going to do some content research that's user-centered, again, all about the user, of these ideas we've got, and actually make our keyword list. We have access to billions of searches per month. It's fantastic. There's no better user research tool than search, than SEO, because, or PPC, I should say, because we actually can see what our audience is searching for within our niche or category at any one particular time. We have access to so much data. It's fantastic. What are they searching for within your sector? Let's have, you know, let's use some fun tools to have a dig in and see what we can get. Now, user-centered design tries to optimize your products around users, so user-centered content and keyword research is getting our content or our keywords around users. Simple as that, very obvious. Some of the questions you might be using to help do this are like, what are the users of the document going to look for? Who are the users of the document? What are the users' tasks and goals? What information might users need in order to make a decision? on your page and what form might it be in. These are classic user-centered design questions we can apply to search. I'll give you an example. I've got uh, an e-commerce website. So I might ask my content or my content topic I'm researching here, what decisions do the user need to do to be able to narrow down their choices? What criteria needs to be met in order for someone to choose? What are the advantages they're looking for? What benefits they need? I have a great example of this. I used to uh, work with a domestic appliance company, and they said, oh, we've got a honeycomb drum. It was very important to them on their content that they had this honeycomb front and center. 
So I eventually said, why do I have to keep mentioning honeycomb drum? What does it mean? They said, oh, it reduces ironing. And I was like, that's the benefits. We immediately changed everything to being the, the content around it and the explanation and content of the product page is that we have a drum that helps save on iron because it keeps the clue smoother, so it reduces the amount of creases. Fantastic. That's what you need one to be thinking about, this kind of level. So you can very easily take classic user center design questions, turn them into about instead of being about your product or your document, being about your web page or about your keyword. Now, one of my best favorite uh, tools for doing this, the one that I've had the most success with, is probably SEMrush. Search Metrics also does a really good job of this. I'm really used to using SEMrush, and there's a really good article by Refu Geeks, uh, by Rishi, about the tool. I recommend you go and check it out if you've not already and you're a fan of SEMrush. It's really, really good stuff. Now, here you can see I've just put in pnoferries.com. Again, I'm looking at the ferries, and um, I can see all the keywords they rank for, but more importantly, I can also see which page ranks for them in the volume. So with the volume, I can then extrapolate how much expected traffic they get based on average click-through rates and so on. But more importantly, I can export all this data and do a pivot table or what calculation you like and actually look at each individual landing page and say which keywords do they rank for, what's the expected traffic, and kind of then look at this and say, here's this resource, here's this successful page on this topic, what questions is it answering? What is the implied question behind each of those keywords? How is it answering them? And obviously, with so much showing you what they're ranking for in the top 20, it's the ones it's answering pretty blooming well. So you want to be understanding what's successful about it, and then replicate and do for yourself. Another great thing you can do in SEMrush is the domain versus domain charts. I love this. Now, in here I've got Pizza Hut, Domino's, and Papa John's. I wasn't hungry when I wrote this, honestly, Governor. But um, interestingly, you can put them in and see all the unique and crossover keywords. Now, these are local search terms. There's going to be quite a few unique terms for each of them, which is locally based. But the interesting thing is, I want to know what I can sort of select any of these segments you can see within this Venn diagram, including the ones where no, they've got their unique keywords. Filter out the local terms and actually go export it. What what are the unique things they're they're writing about that I'm not? So I've got three here. I'll make sure one of them is mine. And I'll go right. Are the my two competitors? What are they writing about that I'm not? Are they answering questions that I should be answering? Are they talking on a topic that I'm an expert on that I want to make sure I show up as an authority on? Perhaps even more interestingly is the then crossover part where both your competitors are ranking for terms that you're not. Now again, you might have some local terms in there, but if they're both writing a topic that you're not, surely that might be something you should be talking about as well. Let's work out, is it something I can, I can do an even better job of? Are they, and more importantly, perhaps, what are they both talking about? And what are they both not talking about that I do think is wrong? Where can I own the sector? Where can I get a bit of leverage above them? That's a very cool thing to be doing as well. Google Trends. Now, I think this is uh, often quoted, but actually seldom used by many people. I've gone back to my ferries to see what the head terms tell me about, uh, you know, uh, what the head terms are we actually be using. So ferries to France or France ferries, which one should I actually be using? Well, the answer apparently is France ferries, an escrimatically helpful one. But interestingly, they're both going down uh, in search popularity. It's interesting to know how with Google Trends that the grass going down might not mean less search volume because it's a comparative thing. It's actually just saying that of all the searches done in Google, over the course of this time, it's become a less popular thing. Now, of course, there's more searches being done, so it might be actually relatively it's still very popular. That's what the terms tell you. Is, you know, that's where you do put it into your keyword tool, and that's where you can find more actual information. But it's a starting point. I want to know if it's a growing topic or not. What you're looking for is big spikes upwards or downwards. It's something over the last 12 months has really rocketed up in popularity. It's a, you know, an aspect of your product service, and you're not talking about it. It shows that this isn't a flash in the pan. This is something that actually is happening. You need to be getting on that. But similarly, if you've got something that's going down, are you using the right terminology? Does this mean that it's either a product users don't want? Or is it simply that they're using different language now or asking a different question about it, and that's where you need to be focusing your efforts? The related searches you get underneath are really helpful as well because it gives you more again, content keyword ideas. Scraping Google Suggest is uh, one of the most popular things I think I've introduced to my clients. 
uh, for getting keyword ideas. So you know, it's the simple way of going, hey, these are real terms people are searching for. These are things that people want to know about, and they often are quite medium or long tail terms. So you've got a chance of writing for them. The user intent behind them is clear, and it's much easier to actually build content to focus on them. Now, we can use uh, various suggest scrapers to find out what people are talking about right now on our topic, and there's a number of them out there. Keyword tool.io, keyword key, we knew we suggest three of the best ones out there. There are others. You can see that some of the uh, searches I've got on the right hand side here immediately come up with some good ideas. Um, are ferries to France running, um, running today? Ferry to France um, as a foot passenger, again, foot passenger comes up. What is the best ferry to France? What is the fastest ferry to France? Again, Long, you know, medium and long versions of our core keywords where user intent is much easier to imply. I can write about an authority and I can produce a useful answer to a question someone is searching for. Again, I'm providing answers, guys. That's the thing I want to get across again. I'm providing an answer to a search through my knowledge. We know that. Uh, Google has been, you know, very hot on this with the uh, search guideline, the search rate guidelines that uh, got released last month. There's a large section there on EAT. Uh, what's important, uh, you know, for a search rate in terms of looking at the quality of content, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Three words, only one of which I can say very easily. This kind of content, where we're answering these kind of questions that come up in Google Suggest, allows us to appeal to those because we're actually answering obvious questions. If a search engine is looking on a topic of ferries to France and sees that I've got related content on what the fastest one is, what the most helpful one is, all these kind of things. It sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't do this. And we can see that with the Google rating guidelines asking about them, if we talk about it, we should benefit as a result. Now, if I'm going to go on about Google Suggest, my favorite one of those at the moment is Ask the Audience. I think it's one of my favorite ideas for tools in years, I really do think it is. It's a great way to see all the prepositions from scraping Google Suggest, but expanded uh, to also include things apart from Google Suggest, you know, people just asking along the internet generally. And it's all done in a really visual format. So you go to the website, you see this nice gentleman in his woolly jumper here. You spend a bit of time looking at him, and he's in his over, he's moving around like a moving gif, and he's just uh, gradually gets exasperated with you. But you put in your topic, and you get to. Uh, Answer the public, uh, as the title suggests. So you can see here, I've put in content marketing as my, uh, as my, you know, sort of uh, topic to get questions for. Click on the quick get to questions button, and I'm presented with this, and I get this large wheel. Now, obviously, it's a very small font, takes me to read it, but there's a, a bunch of questions in there, such as what's content marketing, how content marketing helps SEO, how to start content marketing, how to sell content marketing, how to use content marketing, how to measure content marketing. Wow, there's a whole bunch of questions. You can see in the center of the circle, you've got the prepositions. Why, how, which, who, what, and the great thing is you click on the various buttons to get the data, and it gives you even more. So on the right-hand side here, you can see that um, it showed me uh, another whole section on versus of content marketing versus SEO, content marketing versus inbound marketing, all these kind of things. Um, great related topics. Now, I've got a blog on content marketing. The White Dot Net uh, website has a blog. We're using this to help inform our blog strategy because we can see there's topics that actually have been asked somewhere online. Some of them are from Google Suggest, some of them are from help forms. If you go to ask, uh, uh, ask the audience, uh, sorry, ask the public, uh, explains how it gets its data. But it gets lots of different points. And it also gives it alphabetically. So if you don't want to just scrape Google Suggest in the classic way, a keyword kiwi and keyword tool, I will also give you a chance to add suppositions and prepositions to um, your uh, to your main keyword to get interesting ideas. But I said that you know keyword research, agile thinking, all this stuff is about answering questions. Well, Google Suggest and scraping it and tools such as Answer the Public are the best way of actually finding questions that people are asking and you can answer. If you pick the right topic, which has got lots of keyword variations, it doesn't have to all be questions, but you find the question variant of the keyword that you can answer, which allows you then to touch upon all the regular keyword variations you'd normally be targeting, you can produce content that is deliberately helpful because it's answering a question. And that's what I want to be doing. So I've got all my ideas, I've got all my stuff here, what do I do next? How do I come, you know, uh, come to uh, 
take this stuff, I've got my audience insight, I've got my keywords, how do I put it on my website? And the starting point I do with this is user stories. I take my personas and what the audience wants and I map the journey. You can see the example here, this is from the Gather Content blog, as a blank, I want to blank so that I can get some benefit. So, as a holiday maker, I want to find the fastest ferry to France so I can book a ticket. Real of example, I might want to book a ticket, I might want to plan my holiday. I might want to make a recommendation. Doesn't matter. The point is, is that you actually plan your journey. So you've got your keywords, you've got your volumes, you've got your difficulties, you've got your good stuff there, and you go, right, how am I going to build the content? What's the best way of doing that? That's this, sometimes I think the gap. Uh, they're trying to answer the gap here between create game create great content that we're always being told to do and actually doing it. And the first thing is actually asking the audience and understanding what they want. And the second thing is actually they're mapping it out. So just going, right, oh, loads of people want to know about a phrase to France and just building a page on the internet. Just a few minutes just planning out the user journey. And it might be the same way one page can answer hundreds of keywords. One page might be answer a few different user journeys, isn't you know, because we're building good sized resources. But just by doing this, it makes a lot of sense and suddenly becomes much easier to produce content that's actually worth a damn, actually content that answers the question rather than just being a targeting keywords for the sake of search. Now if you haven't got access to some of this stuff, you may not have access to personas for example, well you can cheat. You can cheat. There's a good things. Um, on the previous slide, I meant there was a, a link to seed keywords. Now, if you haven't got a user journey, seed keywords is a great thing to do. It gives you keyword ideas as well. But the idea is you put up an experiment. You say, "Hi, I, I, I want to." Now, my scenario is that I want to book uh, a ferry ticket to France, and then you share it with people. It can be your work colleagues, it can be the client, it can be friends, it doesn't matter. And you just ask them what search term would they put in to Google to look for that. So it's a great way of finding natural language, a great way of finding you know, sort of common patterns and such things. It's also a way of thinking about user, user journeys, user stories, because it makes you actually think about what are they asking. And from that, you can look at that direct question they're asking and going, oh, hang on, okay, so that's what they've asked. What's the user journey for that question when someone actually types into Google? And then personas on this page, YouGov, have got this great tool where you can look up, put in any subject or topic. It's got a limited list, but it's, it's quite expansive. Um, and get really detailed information from the government on what they think these people are into. So here I've got this information you can see on screen. It's all for a web designer. This is someone who's interested in web design. Apparently he's an uh, average age of 25 to 39, lives in East Anglia, and his most likely job is in information technology, which can't really be a surprise. But there's things like um, 500 to 900, pounds average uh, spare income per month. Favourite clothing lines are George, Dolce & Gambana, and John Lewis. Not quite sure that you'll find three more disparate shopping experiences uh, to, uh, to, to to compare from there, but there we go. Our favorite supermarket, Tesco's, most likely pet to have a cat. All kinds of information. There's also information on there about likes, dislikes, all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's just a, a, a good starting point. If you've got no personas from your company or from your client to actually go, right, here's our target audience. I've got my user journey, what kind of user journey is going to appeal to this persona? Just putting these things together. Again, it doesn't have to be long, it doesn't have to be hectic. People think of personas as having to have research for days by expensive companies. It's great if you can do that, but if you can't, you can do a quick and dirty method to fill the gap and plan your user journey for your content. Next up, wireframing. Wireframing is not just for web designers, it's great for us. Uh, able to draw on a whiteboard, then you can create a wireframe. You don't have to be artistic, it's really cool. And what I want to do is actually go, the same way I'd plot a web flight uh, design using wireframe, I want to plan this user journey and the content flow. It might be having a couple to show through pages, or it might be on one page to show how the content is going to flow from R2 to point A to point B, and links to other pages where they're useful. Use wireframes so your content has a space and workflow. Again, you want to be able to produce great content, Take all these learnings you've made and plan out the journey and then physically show how it's going to look. So then when you actually create the content, you've already planned it out. Balsamic is really cool. There's other wire framing tools available. Put together your storyboard of what you want to create. And then if you have to go to a web designer, if you have to go to a client, if you have to go to your boss, whoever you have to go to to get this thing to actually happen, it might even be yourself. You've actually got a reason for doing it and you've planned it out and you're ready to go and do it. You can even on the wireframe point out the sections where different keyword variants are being targeted at different points. That's what I've done for clients in the past. So I was saying, no, your headers answering this question. Then this subheading's on point A, this subheading's on point B. And these links over here ask these supplementary questions. And we know, again, from the Google Rater guidelines, 
for the supplementary content is really important. Quick example of how you can do this to get your own creative juices flowing. Uh, back Lake Brian Dean, very popular SEO, does a lot of good stuff. He has a thing called the skyscraper content theory, you know, a theory technique, as is written down here. The idea, of course, is you create something that is so much bigger and better than everybody else's. It's like a skyscraper, it really stands out in the skyline and can't be missed. Now, this is a great theory for us because if we are looking to create content our audience wants, if we can actually find that first of all and then build something that answers that question better than anyone else, we know that we'll be able to outreach it more successfully, we'll be able to build links to it more successfully, we'll be able to promote it via social media more successfully. It will appear naturally for more keywords successfully because it's unrelevant as always we want to have some kind of authority. The point is whatever part of your SEO campaign you're in, having content that stands out from the crowd is vital for success in answering that question. So let's get excited about the possibilities for content. By doing one of the things we've talked about here, you will gain insight into your audience. You don't have to do all of them, just do some and get some insight. Start producing content that tells the story of how they might want to use your products and service. Again, reduce ironing, not a honeycomb drum. Tell them what stories they have on how things should be. So if your audience, if your product solves a problem, show them how your uh, product or service makes their world how it should be, not how the current problem is. So the stories of their questions, they ask a question, show them how your product or service answers that question. I type in a, a question such as, uh, what camera is best to use, DSR or SLR camera? Have some content that answers the question, shows them the story of how answering that question makes their lives better. This all comes together to that really cool thing to be able to create really inventive, helpful, useful content that you can be proud of and market successfully. Agile thinking is really important to me now. It's become something that really pervades my mind when I talk to my clients. So the thing I want to take away, that agile thinking can be done by anyone doing SEO content. If you're doing SEO content, you don't have to stop doing SEO content to do agile thinking content. It's the same, it's just an evolution. It's content development idea and agile thinking being the glue that binds all these different angles and these different tools we have together. One step at a time, focus on the user, learn what you have to make. Fantastic stuff. And agile thinking creates the content development environment we need for user led content. User led content is what we want because user led content is useful content. And what we're seeing through Panda, through the Phantom Updates, through Rank Brain, through the user guidelines, all the clues we get from Google about what they're looking for content-wise, which people say, what does great content mean? This is what it means. It's useful content because it's useful content, it's useful to the audience. And if it's useful to the audience, it answers their questions. And answering questions is what Google wants because Google presents answers so that people keep clicking on ads so they keep making money. Simple as that. To go back to the Google advert from earlier, I really do feel that little bit of inspiration when I see this. Because I love how a question can take a user anywhere, just as they put right here in their advert. A question can take you anywhere. And by being useful, by answering questions, by thinking with an agile attitude to how we build our content, it can take them, via that question, to our website, so then we can make our money. You can grab the slides at uh, this little link here. It's WHDOT, as in white dot, and then dot net slash understand audience two. I will be tweeting it regularly over the next 24 hours or so. And hopefully, so will the nice people at Caboose. You can get the slides. Uh, and I'd just like to say uh, once again, thank you very much for listening to me wobble on for the last little while. It's been really enjoyable. I hope I've managed to inspire you a little bit to think agile about your content and to understand that, hey, all we've got to do is answer some questions to please the Google. And uh, if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter at PageShorts or send me an email, charlie at whitedonnet. I'll be delighted to answer any you have. Thank you very much. Charlie, thank you very much for doing such an incredible presentation. I really love it. Actually, it's um, what I totally think of when I see all those, let's say, kind of trash and useless content which really doesn't solve any problems. So I totally agree that we should, as an expert in this industry and any content market especially, should be really focused on producing content that uh, at least uh, solves 
uh, users' problem. And I, I, and, yeah, and I really encourage our listeners to share their questions. Meanwhile, I have a question to you. Uh, because you are um, you are like sharing an idea how you can uh, get all those uh, user centered content by doing surveys. And what are your thoughts about Twitter polls? Do you think they are, can be useful in terms of getting uh, user centered data, or still um, it, it's not a good source of doing of using it in that way? Twitter polls. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think actually, if you have a large enough audience, and you have a, you know, it depends on the question you're trying to answer. But yes, I absolutely. If you have a large enough audience, and you can distill your question down to a single point, such as what's more relevant to you, X or Y, or you know, something very simple like that. If you can get a concrete answer about what's important, it gives you a little bit of insight into your audience. And you can then use that as a reason to do some keyword research around that topic, determine if it's worth the effort of you creating, which you've probably already done in order to answer the question, and uh, then produce your content because you've got some evidence that you're on the right track, that you're answering a point. So yeah, you've got to word the question carefully, but I would say definitely, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we have uh, a question from... Um... Katie, she's asking um, how you can do a quick check of a content uh, in order to understand whether it's going to solve any kind of a problem for your user or not. Do you use any kind of techniques or you have a systematic approach to that? That's a good, very good question. Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, I'm going to answer it in two parts. Um, do we have a systematic approach? Yes, uh, for many of our campaigns, we do a content inventory as one of the kickoff points of a large SEO campaign or, or audit. And with that, we'll produce a very large spreadsheet in the classic content strategy style. Um, there's some great stuff on content inventories by in the um, uh, by Christine Halverson and by Erin Kassane in their respective books on it. But we'll do a large spreadsheet and within that we'll actually note down what the target is for um, each kind of piece of content. Obviously the home page is quite difficult but generally you can understand what the target goal of both us as the uh, website and the user is. So there's that. In terms of a quick way of actually looking at your content and going what questions does it answer, I will do the research. If I haven't done the full inventory, I'm just doing a bit quicker. I, once I've got my research of the questions I think we should be answering, I will then just get, uh, you know, use them like a quick crawl of the website if it's a relevant section, Screaming Frog, Deep Crawl, whatever, and then actually just do a manual process of going which questions of these do these try and answer, or look at the content, work out which content they try and answer, and then just say, do they do a good job or not? Um, a good way of quickly finding that out is to actually ask the client or your boss or whoever and actually say look give them a list of the content and just get them for a few minutes and say which of these bits of content are you happy with or are you proud of and which ones do you actually kind of not care about and all the ones and you'll find most of people kind of go oh I'm not sure about that one or no I don't really care about that any ones that they get, they get that kind of response you know aren't going to do a good job because if the people who have it don't care about it the users aren't going to care about it um, I think to answer the questions, try and answer succinctly. Do a crawl of the content so I've got a list of it. Understand what questions they're trying to answer and then compare that to my list of questions I think we should be answering. And if you want to get more technical, you can use something like SEMrush or Search Metrics to see, actually take those bits of content, get your implied questions you think it's about and then compare it to what keywords it does rank for and see if Google thinks it's doing a good job or not. That's got a bit of a clue as well. Thank you very much for such insightful answer. I think there is like kind of an option as well. If you have a sufficient flow of traffic, you can just simply uh, make some kind of a pop-up window on your page and ask mm -hmm. your users whether it's answering uh, their needs or not. So whether they, uh, yeah, I noted that some kind of approach which uh, I see sometimes on a websites like uh, tutorials or something like that where you have like those kind of windows uh, that asking you whether it was like sufficient and it solves your problem or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah you get those on the Microsoft and the Apple websites, don't you? Did it, what did this job, uh, sorry, did this uh, page do a good job of answering your question, yes or no? And it's amazing how much feedback you can just ascertain from just a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think it's, it's pretty simple and you should definitely have a, a good bunch of traffic to check it because if you have like a couple of visitors on your page, then it's going to be relevant in that case. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, Charlie, for sharing. Um, so that's all for our questions today, but we have a really attentive listeners and we want to thank them for joining us today and hope to see you guys on our next webinars as well as we hope to see Charlie um, and one of our next webinar next year. So thank you very much, uh, Charlie, for joining us today and finding a time and sharing your knowledge and expertise in content marketing and in digital, digital marketing in general. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you and have a lovely day. Bye bye. Cheers. Uh, Cheers. Bye bye. Take care. Cheers. Thank you.